For those who are just coming in, I encourage you to come sit up close to the front so you can see better. We're going to be drawing a few things tonight, so if you can't see well, we also have the drawings in your books. So uh, if you can't see what's up here, don't worry. Every drawing will be in your Bible Basics book in either English or Spanish. Por los que hablan puramente español, ¿hay alguien aquí que tiene problemas con el, la tecnología para traducción en este momento? ¿Alguien? Ok. ¿No funciona en este momento? No todavía. Ok. All right, we can move our way into the church. Those are in the lobby. Uh, as soon as we can, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. There's plenty of uh, room up here as well. They're nice padded seats, yeah. Okay, por los que hablan español y si la tecnología no está funcionando, entonces levante la mano muy alto y haga así para indicar que están en estrés, ¿ok? Está bien, y vamos a buscar un lugar para traducir si no funciona. ¿Está funcionando ahora? ¿Entiendo? ¿Sí? Ok. Good. Oh, sí, no, no todavía. Ok, let's check it out. que usan la tecnología de traducción está, está tra transmitiendo hoy ahora, está funcionando o si no está funcionando, levanta la mano ok, por los dos ok no, no, no está ok y por levanta la mano otra vez si no está funcionando ahora ok, okay la mayoría what? What? No, es, es, no es que no funciona este, uh, William, can you talk a little bit so they can hear you Oh, he's talking. Okay. All right. So, si no está escuchando. Si no está funcionando, sigue a María. Okay. <laughs> Ella va a ayudarle. Okay. O puede pedir al Espíritu Santo para que traduce. <laughs> Good. 
All right, uh, we've still got some folks that are coming in, um, but we'll go ahead and we will get started uh, tonight. There's a lot of really important stuff tonight, so. Um, yes. All right, let's stand and pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Reading from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the rivers. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He'll receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. Let the King of glory come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. That the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of glory. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Those who are coming in, I encourage you, we still have a lot of seats up here. You can see a little bit better. Uh, we even have some nice padded chairs up here. It's really nice. Uh, just as a reminder, the Blessed Sacrament has been removed, and so if you have a question or if you want uh, to, to ask something uh, during the discussion, it's fine. You don't have to feel uh, embarrassed about doing that uh, in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, tonight, friends, we're going into Lesson 2. I hope you all had time to read the scriptures uh, for this week. Um, I, the title for this, uh, just off the top of my head, is What's the Point? What's the point of everything? What's the point of creation? What's your, the point of your life? That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. The Bible is so incredible, and these first chapters of Genesis are so important for us to understand. And the first three chapters, we're not going to get to all three tonight. I think we're just going to get through the first two. We'll see. I've got the third one ready, but I don't think we'll make it, because the first two are so important. And they're going to ask these questions. It's going to tell us what the purpose of creation is, what your purpose is, and the reason why everything is so messed up today. That's chapter three. And in chapter three, when we get to it, we're going to see God's desire to restore everything to the glory that it had in the beginning. So to understand that, we have to know what that glory was when we started out. As we go through these chapters, we're going to talk about two keys to understanding all the rest of the Bible. Okay? One is called the liturgical, this color may not be good, the liturgical orientation of creation. That's a long phrase. Say it with me. Liturgical orientation of creation. And the second is called the nuptial orientation of creation. You say it with me. Nuptial orientation of creation. We'll explain what those terms mean. Don't worry about it right now. Yes. Yes. No se mira, yeah, eso, eso no funciona, yeah, so, lo siento, yeah, es, es decir, es nupcial y liturgical, verdad, la orientación de la creación, so, I'll use a different color, green is terrible, I apologize, okay, all right, so, let's look at this, um, the first chapter of Genesis is going to show us the liturgical orientation of creation, and the second chapter is going to show us the nuptial orientation, so the first chapter shows us what creation's purpose is, and the second chapter is going to show us what your purpose is as men and women, okay? Now, tradition, the Jewish tradition and our Catholic tradition teaches us that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, okay? This is really important, right? Now, there are many people today who don't think that. Uh, they think that uh, maybe uh, lots of other people contributed things, uh, saying but what we really do believe is Moses or someone around his time did compile these things. It's one single author. Why is that important? Because you're going to see all of these first five books of the Bible relate to each other, and they presume you're reading them together as one unit. The Jews call that first five books of the Bible the law, 
okay? They call it the law, and it's really important for them. They see it all as written by Moses. They interpret it that way. That's the way it's always been read. So if you read it as books in isolation, you're going to get weird ideas. Does that make sense? It goes back to that idea we talked about. Remember that big word for how we read the Bible? The canonical method. Yes, very good. Remember that? Canonical method of reading the Bible, reading the Bible according to the whole canon of Scripture, all the books, reading them together. That's what we're going to see, how Genesis fits with everything else, okay? Now, the law was opposed to the prophets, which was a bunch of the other books, right, or the historical writings, okay? So right now we're in the law, and we're going to stay there for the rest of this year until Christmas, okay? Because it's really important that we understand what's going on in the law, okay? Now, Every time we study Genesis, we run into a problem, okay? And what is that problem? The seven days of creation, yes. <laughs> is it really seven days, Father? Do you really believe all that stuff? And the answer is uh, yes. Well, no, uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, the, the reality is, is that there's always this debate about the seven days. Is it seven literal days or is it seven metaphorical days, okay? Now, this is a, not a new debate that we just all of a sudden found out because science came along. Even in the early church, they debated this. There were church fathers who thought it was literally seven 24-hour days, and you had people like Augustine in the fourth century who said, for God, a thousand years is a day, day is a thousand years. So already you have that debate going on in the church, and it's not been resolved dogmatically. You can believe what you like, as long as you have good reasons for it. There is, in fact, a Catholic center called the Colby Center for Creation that advocates for a young earth. They're Catholics and they're scientists, but most people don't agree with them, right? So you have this tension in the church's teaching. So I think what we have to just do is set that aside for a minute, because I think you're going to find, as we go through Genesis 1 and 2, that question is unimportant. Why? Why is it unimportant? Well, because... Uh, it seems like, if you remember last time, we said the Bible is without error in everything that the authors want to assent, right? And so we have to ask the question, was the purpose of Genesis 1 to give us a scientific account of where everything came from? No. There's actually three questions that Genesis is trying to teach us in these first chapters. The first is, who is God? Who is God? The second is, what's the purpose of creation, right? What's the purpose of creation? I can't even spell anymore, sorry. Of creation, I've been driving most of the day today. Thank you for your prayers, it was a great convocation. We'll share more of that later. And then the third is, what's your purpose, right? What's the purpose of humanity? Of humanity. And it's going to do this humanity, humanity, there we go. I don't even know what it, that is, humanity. Okay. All right, so let's go through Genesis 1, and we'll see what the details uh, show us. Okay. So go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Genesis 1, and we'll start reading, because that's why we're here. It's the first book of the Bible, so it's pretty easy to find. Just open it up. Okay, very good. All right, now this is why translation is super important. Already in the very first verse of the Bible... What does it say? Let's just read it together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, some of your translation will say, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, right? Alrighty, we have a problem, right? It's saying one of them indicates uh, that it's already there, right? And the other indicates that God created stuff out of nothing, right? The Hebrew literally says, in the beginning, God created, right? So that's the literal translation of what's happening. So in the beginning, there was nothing, and then God created everything, right? So in the beginning, there is God. There's nothing else. God is not created. So some people ask, who made God? Nobody. Because if somebody made God, that would be God, right? Does that make sense? So God is the one being that is not part of the creation. He's not bound by time. He makes everything. Nothing made him, okay? With, he, he is the uncreated creator. Make sense, everybody? So that answers the question, who is God? God is not a part of creation. God is separate from the creation. Really important, okay? We see the state of when he's making things. The earth is without form and void. In Hebrew, tohu vabohu. All right, everybody say that with me. Tohu vabohu. All right, that's Hebrew, and that means higgledy-piggledy, okay? So it actually means chaotic and empty, okay? So there's chaos and it's empty, and God's going to fix that as we go through creation. He's going to order it, and then he's going to fill it, okay? So if you read the chapter, it goes this is pretty well. Um, we're going to see that 
the, the days of creation, God creates a structure to the universe. And let's look at it really quickly. So if you're drawing, we're going to go ahead and create the drawing. So you make, go ahead and, and make this with me if you want. It's very fun. You too can be an artist. Okay. So what we do is we make a, a sort of a box structure here, roughly like that. And then we divide it in half. And then we make it into thirds, just like this. So you got six sort of squares. See, I'm not an artist. I can't make perfect things. All right. And then you've got a house roof on the top here. Okay. All right. So and then we'll number these right here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay. So what happens here? Now we come to verse three. Oh, so, so sorry, verse two. The earth was without form and void, tohu vabohu, and darkness upon the face of the deep, the spirit of God moving over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. How does God create? By speaking, right? So by the word of God, the universe is created. This is really important. So we see already an element here. We have God who exists in the beginning, there's the spirit of God that's hovering over the water and his word. You notice something interesting about that? Sort of a threefold nature of God, right? It's not explicit, but it's hidden already. We have the seeds of the blessed trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're going to get to that very explicitly when you get to John chapter 1. If you have John's gospel, we're going to have you uh, open up to that if you know where the gospel of John is, right? What does it say? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So here's the thing. What is the light? The light is God's word. So the light actually is the son of God who becomes flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. You see already the first page. It's exciting. Okay. Oh, it's so good, right? But you see... Until we really go, I can't get ahead of ourselves. Okay, we can't spoil the ending. Okay, here we go. You already know the ending. It's all right, but you're going to get it spoiled for you many times. Okay, so now we see, let's just go ahead and go really quickly through and see what God creates and in the order that he makes it, because that's important, okay? It says, God, let there be light. So let's go ahead and separate this, and you've got like darkness on here and then light over here. Okay, so maybe just radiant light. I don't know, just something like that. Okay, that doesn't make any sense at all. That is chaotic and stupid. Okay. Erase that. Okay. Forget I did that. Okay. So we'll just say uh, light and darkness. So you can just make little indications of what your squiggles mean. Okay. And then he called the light day, the darkness he called night, evening and morning followed, one day. And then God said, so he speaks again, let there be a firmament in the midst of the, the waters to divide waters above, waters below. Right? So you have, he's creating the sea and the sky. Okay? So we can go ahead and draw water here. Okay? And then we've got the clouds, little fluffy cloud. Right? Uh, that's terrible also. I'm sorry. I'm just going to stop right there. Okay? Sea and sky. Okay? All right? So that's day two. Okay? God creates sea and the sky, separated the waters, and it was so. God called the firmament heaven. And there was evening and the morning, a second day. And this is important. We talk about heaven. Heaven is a broad term. It means everything up there, right? There's different levels of heaven. There's the heaven that's in the earth, and then there's the heavens that are in outer space, and there's the heaven where God dwells, right? So the, the Hebrews have an idea. There's a stratification of heaven, which is important when you get to St. Paul. And you see St. Paul being taken up to the seventh heaven to see where God is, right? So that's interesting for later. Okay, now we come to the third part. What does God do? Okay. All right, God said, this is verse 9, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, God called the dry land earth and the waters were gathered together, he called the seas. And God saw it was good and God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit in it, which is in their seed, according to their kind upon the earth. So let's go ahead and just make uh, this thing I'm feeding back a little bit here, a little too hot. Okay, all right, so we've got the land... And then maybe we'll just leave this open and have like the sea over here. I don't know. Okay, so little fruit things and, you know, plants, herbs. Okay, so we have the earth. So the land. Boop. Land, which comes out of the sea. So the sea, it's, in a sense, it's, it's sort of the water, the, the land emerges from the waters. So life emerges from the waters. The waters are a place of chaos and death and rebirth, okay? So we're gonna, that's an important motif all throughout the Bible. Okay, so now we come to day four. Here's something where it really gets interesting. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament to heaven to separate the day from the night 
And let them be for signs, seasons, and days, and years. Let them be lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. What's that? The sun. And the lesser light to rule the night. What's that? The moon. Okay. So we have the sun and... I don't know how to distinguish that except the darkness and you got the moon, okay? You know something interesting about this? We haven't had a sun or a moon for three days. How do we know what a day is? You see? Already the scriptures are telling us that this isn't meant to be read as a 24-hour day period because you don't have that regulation of time until the sun and the moon on day four. So again, it's a mystery. It's speaking about mysteries, okay? So there's no conflict between science and faith. There isn't. There's one truth. And if there is a conflict between science and faith, it is an apparent contradiction. There are several problems. One could be a misinterpretation of the text. The other could be the science is wrong. And the third can be we misunderstand what the point of the story is, right? And that's what we're talking about. The point of Genesis is not principally to give us seven 24-hour days. That's not the point, right? So now we're seeing the time is regulated. And what's the purpose of the sun and the moon? It says they're for signs and seasons and days and years. And that phraseology is designed to tell us about feast days for worship. So the sun and the moon are to tell the Israelite people when are the feast days to worship God. Interesting. So the purpose, you see that liturgical purpose of creation, it's meant to show us God. It's meant to draw us back into union with him and draw us into that. So the sun and the moon are already giving the voice to that. Okay. So now we come to the fifth day. Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and birds fly above the earth across the firmament of the heavens. So God made the great sea monsters, every living creature that moves, and the waters, uh, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas. And let birds multiply on the earth. Okay, so now we have the water, and we've got little fishies. So we'll draw a little fishy. Yes, isn't that nice? Two fishies. Yes, because they will then multiply. Okay. <laughs> and the little birds. Yeah, happy little birds. Okay. Those are terrible birds. Okay. All right. All right. So then we've got uh, birds and fish. So you notice the first three days God created the spaces and now God is filling them. So he's taking care of the tohu, which was the, the chaos. So now he's ordered it and now he's filling the bohu, which is the emptiness, right? He's making it now full. Okay, so that's, that's the point. And now we come to the, the sixth day. Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle, creeping things, beasts of the earth according to their kinds. It was so. God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, cattle, etc., etc. And God saw it was good. All right? So we've got the land. We've got animals. Make a little giraffe because they are fun to draw. Okay. But only one of them because I can't draw two. No, just kidding. We'll draw two. Okay. Okay, so we got little cattle over there. And then lastly, God said, this is verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So isn't that interesting? Like we think we're hearing man, right? But he's really talking about men and women both. Okay, so it's a colloquial expression, right? So he's using that to say, I'm creating man and and they're in his image and likeness together as men and women. So it's not like man is somehow in the image of God and woman isn't. Make sense? They are both in the image and likeness of God, and we'll talk about that in a second. So we have now animals created on the sixth day, and then men and man and woman. Okay? And God then after he sees them, right, God saw everything he was made and he calls it very good, right? So everything up to this point has been good, and now he says it is very good. So what does that say? Man and woman being made in the image and likeness of God is the crown of creation. It's the greatest thing God has made, right, is us. And in fact, he gives man and woman dominion over all of the birds and the fish. Notice he doesn't give dominion over the sun and the moon, right? That's important for later, right? Who has dominion over the sun and the moon? God, right? He doesn't give him dominion over the sea and the sky. Who has dominion over that? God, right? But the land and the animals and all the... But not the, not the sea creatures, interestingly. Huh? And that, that's why we're afraid of sea monsters, right? <laughs> we don't have dominion over them. We can't tame them, right? Sailors have always been afraid of sea monsters, right? Because the sea is chaos and we have no control over it, right? 
That's something that's very mysterious, but we'll get back to that, maybe. I don't know. We'll see if we get to it. Okay, now we come to the seventh day. All right, so we get to the seventh day, and then we get to the, the rest, the day of rest. God, this is in chapter two, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work, which he had done, and rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all his work, which he had done in creation. Quick question, does God need to rest? Does God get tired? Does God sleep? Why does he rest? To show us, because he doesn't need to, right? So why would he do it? To show us the purpose of creation, right? So rest, the Sabbath, which is worship. It's another word for worship, right? We're, we're to be with God, to rest with him, okay? So, <clears throat> we have here now is, is a principle that St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the great teachers of our church, says that what is last in execution is first in intention. Meaning the thing you do last is the thing you wanted to do all along. Okay, so when you're building a house, last thing you do is put on the roof, right? Then you finish the house, right? If you're writing a paper, how many of you have ever written a paper before? Okay, you got a lot of steps first. You got to do your research, and then you've got to, you know, write it out, first draft, and then you got to do your source editing and stuff, and then you got to submit it, and then you do your first draft, and then you do the second draft, and then you so finally submitted it. That last step was what you were trying to do all the time. It's what all that other work was for, right? To finally finish the thing, right? And so that's the same thing with, with God, with creation. All this stuff is a preparation for the rest. So it's showing us that all of creation is ordered, men and women, animals, birds, sea, sky, everything in creation is ordered to the worship of God. Make sense? That's what we call the liturgical, which is another word for worship, right, or the work of the people that's offered to God, liturgical orientation of creation. That's Genesis 1. Cool, huh? Right, so we see that, what does this reveal about God? As we said, he's the creator. He's also um, a God of order, and he is a God who likes to share his creative power. You notice what he does, he says, let the sea team with life, right? So he first, he shares, uh, first he shares power with the land, let the land bring forth vegetation. The land didn't have power to bring life on itself. So God shares the power to give vegetative life to the land first. It's the lowest form of life. So Aristotle teaches us, he's a great philosopher, he teaches us there are three kinds of souls. There's an animal, or there's a plant soul, a vegetative, that only has the power of nutrition, right? It can absorb nutrients and grow. That's all it can do, right? Or re and reproduce, right? So that's what a plant does, right? But then we have the next type of creature, right, that is an animal soul or a soul with appetites. It has the power of motion, it has the power of desire, and, and reproduction, right? And so, so it's a more complex soul, but it only has instincts. It doesn't have the power of self-reflection. A cat, if you have a cat, right, when they go up to a mirror, what do they think it is? Another cat, right? They don't get the idea that this is a them in the mirror, right? Because they don't have the power to understand their identity as a cat. Make sense? So that's the difference between an animal soul and the third part, an, a rational soul, which is what we have as men and women made in the image and likeness of God, okay? So we're in the image and likeness of God because we have the power of intellect and reason, whereas the animals do not. They have, some of them have very complex uh, reflexes and very complex instincts, and they can be trained, right? But the fact is, is that they don't, you never see an animal writing a symphony, right? You never see an animal writing a piece of poetry that they've never heard before, right? There's some animals that are good mimics, right? There are some birds that can imitate songs of other birds, very, the mocking jays, right? They can imitate the, the sound of another bird, but they can't make up a new song they've never heard before. It's like, oh, Frank, that's a lovely song. Where do you get that? You know? No, they, 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 they don't do that, right? So the creative power of humanity is we can create something we've never heard before, that we've never seen before, and that's one of the ways we're in the image and likeness of God, because he created stuff that never existed before. Isn't that cool? That's how we share in the image and likeness of God. One of the ways. There's other ways. Okay. So let's uh, <clears throat> stop right there and let's talk a little bit more about... Is this okay if I erase this? This is in your book, by the way. So you do not have to rely on my horrible drawing. You have a much better one in your book. And some of the kids from last week, they had way better drawings than I did. So I'm going to have to borrow from them. Okay. So let's talk about this really quick. We're made in God's image and likeness. The 
Those two things, image, likeness. What are those two things, right? First, as I mentioned, the image, it's not because we're men and women and we have body parts that we're in God's image and likeness. Because does God have a body? No, God is pure spirit. So we're not in God's image and likeness because we have male body parts or female body parts. That's not how we're in the image and likeness of God, principally. How we're in the image of God, as I mentioned, is having that power of the soul to create, right? And also, we're in the image and likeness of God in a very limited way in the marital union between husband and wife. Because in that one flesh union, there is a communion of persons, there's a love between man and woman that is so real that has the potential to give new life. And so it images the life-giving power of God. That's another way we can create with God's help, right? We become co-creators with God in marriage, right? So uh, that's, uh, this, is, this is something really important that we remember that our bodies are very important. They reveal a truth that your body, if you look at it, it doesn't make sense by itself. You know, it says it doesn't make sense by itself. Your body proclaims there is a, there, I am made for union with someone else. Right? And so on the natural level, that's marriage. But the fact is, is whether you get married or not, because obviously I am not married and there are many people who are not married, the fact is, is that I'm not missing out on my purpose. Because ultimately, marriage is for this life. Who are we made for union with ultimately? God. Right? So the body reveals I'm made for somebody else. On the natural level, if we live marriage well, that trains us for the communion of life-giving love that will be perfectly expressed in the Trinity because marriage ends in this life. Sorry to tell you, you will not be married to your spouse in heaven. But you won't miss them because you will be together with them in God in a way far more deep than you ever were together in this life. And that's what's exciting is you recognize even the marital union, which is beautiful and wonderful, it's imperfect. And I think any couple here who's been married for more than five minutes can tell you that there are some days where the union is really beautiful and other days where it's like, meh. I want, there, it always leaves desiring more. There's got to be more. And that's something written into our bodies to teach us the purpose of your body is not marital intimacy. Although it's beautiful and wonderful and one of the, the, the prime ways that we can see God's communion love written into nature, but ultimately it will end. And it gives way to the perfect communion in heaven, which is not a bodily reality primarily. It's not just simply on the level of our affective pleasure. It's on the level of our whole self. Heaven will be the complete fulfillment of all desire, not just our physical desires, but our emotional and spiritual desires as well. Isn't that awesome? Right? So, so we're going to see we're made in God's image because we are persons made for communion with others. And God is a communion of persons that is life-giving and loving and completely self-giving, okay? And complementary. We are in his likeness because of God's grace in our souls, okay? When the fall happens, we retain the image, but we lose the likeness. That's what we're gonna talk about next week, okay? So, all right, so now when we, when we get to day seven, we realize day seven is significant because seven in Hebrew is, is Shiva, which means it, to seven oneself means to make a covenant. And so God, in a sense, is making a covenant with creation, and the Sabbath is the sign of that covenant. So that's going to be maybe more, more explicit later in the law of Moses, later on in the later books. And that's why we see it's all written together. Moses is compiling this to show that this is not just something that God cooked up in Exodus later on or in Deuteronomy in the Ten Commandments, but this is something that has existed since the beginning of creation. God wants us to rest eternally with him in heaven. Okay? Good. All right. So now let's get to um, the purpose of men and women. Okay? Let's go to Genesis 2. How are we doing on time here? Oh, Lord have mercy. Okay, yep. I'm definitely not going to make it Genesis 3. Okay. Okay. So when you look at your Bible, um, headings, whenever you see a heading or a title chapter, those are not in the Bible. Those were added by scholars, so ignore them, okay? <laughs> because this one says, another account of creation. And it's like, really? That, that is, in fact, what many people believe it is. But the fact is, the church has never read it that way. The church has read it always as, the chapter one is showing us a global picture of all of creation, and chapter two is focusing now, zooming in on humanity, on day six, Right? And you can interpret it in the Hebrew that way. The tenses that they put for us here are not necessarily the way it is expressed in the original languages. You can read it in a different way. I can't get into that. But essentially, you're going to read it the way the church reads it. Okay. So let's look at this creation of man in more detail. So let's read it together. This is Genesis 2, verse 4. 
Right? In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no plant of the field was yet in the earth, no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. There was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Okay, so now we have more detail of how God made humanity. So man in Hebrew is ish, right? So he's ish. And the ground is Adama. So you see where Adam comes from, right? That's where his name comes from. He's dirt, right? That's a nice name, right? That's where he came from, right? N names have meaning in Hebrew, okay? So he's called Adam because that's his nature. He came from dirt, right? You'll see funny names later on, and we'll get to that. It's really hilarious, some of the, the, the comedy that's in the Bible because of names. And you're like, well, that's a really offensive name. Okay, anyway. So anyway, um, so Adam, his, he's the dirt, right? But how do you, have you ever tried to make anything with dirt? Like it's really dry and it like falls apart. How do you get dirt to stick together? Got to make it wet, right? So what do you do? <laughs> Spit on it, right? Or you put water on it, right? So it, the tradition in the Jewish uh, mind is that God spat upon the dirt first and formed it into clay, right? Do we see somebody else spitting in the Bible on clay? Hmm, yeah, and what does he do with it? He puts it on man's eyes and then what happens to his eyes? created. Ooh. And remember who's Jesus? He's the word of God, right? Who created the universe. Ah! He's doing it again. He's remaking man. Anyway, okay, sorry, spoiled it. Oh, sorry, I'm just telling you, you're just getting spoiled things. Okay, so uh, God makes the Adama and then breathes his spirit into him to give him life. Okay, so we're going to see um, God then places Adam in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. Okay, and those two words in the Hebrew, avad, if you like your Hebrew, I'm just giving you some Hebrew lesson here. This is all the Hebrew I know, by the way. Avad and Shamar. And I can't write the Hebrew characters because I've forgotten them a long time ago. This is English alliteration, okay? Avad and Shamar, we're going to see in the book of Numbers, is a description for what the priests do in the temple. They tend it and they guard it. So what is Adam guarding? He's guarding Eden, which is this beautiful garden where God dwells with them. It's the sanctuary of creation. Right? God is outside of creation, but he chooses to come into Eden to meet with man and woman. So in a sense, it's like the cosmic temple. It's the temple of creation. And Adam is put there as the first priest to guard Eden and to take care of it. Pretty cool. He's also given dominion over the creatures, and so he is a king. And then God brings him all the animals right, to name. So God, Adam is speaking on God's behalf, so he becomes a prophet. So we see Adam as a priest, prophet, And king. You ever heard those titles before, you Catholics? Yeah. Isn't this your baptismal dignity? It's restoring what Adam had in the garden. We'll get back to that. Okay. So if we draw a picture of this, we've got stick figure Adam, because that's all I know how to draw is stick figures. Okay. And then we draw a crown on him because he's a king. You know, you know, he's got radiant glory because he's a son of God, right? Uh, so image and likeness also means that you're a son of God, right? Because we see in Genesis 4 that Adam had another son, Cain, in his image and likeness. So if God is making Adam and Eve in his image and likeness, what does that mean? We're God's children, right? Pretty exciting, right? So, so he's priest, prophet, king, and we'll draw him with a big mouth because he's, uh, he's, uh, he's speaking uh, God's... Uh... Yeah, anyway, so, and then we'll draw a stole over him to sh indicate his priestly authority. See, I told you... Even a terrible artist can t teach theology. Okay. All right. So uh, now we'll, we'll look and see some of these things. It says uh, he puts them into Eden. Um, so if we're drawing that mountain, which we saw before, it says there's a river running out of it that waters the whole earth. That's how we know it's a mountain because how does water flow? It flows downhill, right? So if there's water flowing, watering the whole earth, Eden has to be the highest point on the earth at that time, right? So it's a mountain, it flows out. We see it's got trees in the garden, the tree of life in the middle of the garden, right? And the tree of knowledge of good and evil also, a little bit off to the side here, okay? And then there's Adam and Eve in it. She's got a little frilly hair. Yay, frilly hair, okay. Um, we haven't seen her yet, but she's coming. Okay, so then God brings the animals to him because it's not good for him to be alone. I'll make him a suitable helpmate. And the word for helpmate in Hebrew is etzer. Say it with me. Etzer, okay? Etzer is always used to describe God, the way he helps us. It's saving help. In the, in the Psalms, we hear, the Lord is my light and my help. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my etzer. Who of whom should I be afraid, right? So if we look and see that God is trying to make a fit helpmate for Adam, he's saying, we need somebody to save this guy. So isn't that interesting? What's a woman's role? To bring salvation to the man. 
who is desperately in need of it. Isn't that interesting? We'll get to that. Okay, so he brings some animals. Do you think God's dumb? Armadillo, is that going to work? No, it's nice, God, but I just don't like it. Oh, snake? No, definitely not. Uh, what, about, uh, what about gerbil? Gerbil? No, I mean, it's fine. Bear? No, too hairy. You know, I mean, like, God knows this already. Why is he doing this? Because Adam doesn't know it. So what God's showing Adam is you are not like any of these other creatures. You're a different kind of animal. And you're alone. Because God knows it, Adam doesn't. And so by experience, God is teaching Adam, because he's a good teacher, God is teaching Adam that he is made for someone else. And it's not any one of these creatures. It's someone made for him. Okay? So now we come to the most beautiful part of it. Okay? When Adam realizes that God puts him to sleep... And then creates a woman from his side, literally. He takes a rib, but it's in the Hebrew, literally, he takes one of his sides out. Okay? Now, this is really important, right? So, uh, oh, golly, goodness gracious. Okay. We'll try and finish this up. Okay. So, woman is not made from the ground like Adam was, right? Adam was made from the ground, but woman is taken from his side, meaning Adam can't say this lady is some inferior dirt. Like, I came from the mountain, she's from the valley over here, right? She's a valley girl, right? We're not going not to deal with her, right? You know? No, he's saying, you, this woman is made from you. She's the same stuff as you. So you can't argue she's less than you. She came from your own body, right? So she has equal dignity to you. And there's no question about that in the very beginning. Men and women are created equal. They're different, very different, but their dignity is the same in the eyes of God. Is there any reason to have prejudice against men or women or the abuse of women in our culture? No, that's a result of the fall. It's not written into creation, okay? So, uh, now we see that um, <laughs> ah, remember what's last in execution? Remember we said what you do last is the most important? So what's created last? Woman. So woman is the most important. See? <laughs> The Catholic Church really likes women, right? They're the crown of creation. Woman is the crown of creation, meaning all of creation is ordered toward the woman. What does that mean? Well, Adam figures it out. When he wakes up, he goes, oh boy, <laughs> bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I'm made for her at last, at last, my love. No, anyway, sorry. Anyway, so, yeah. So anyway, at the end of Genesis 2, we have a marriage. So Adam and Eve get married, okay? So the purpose of, 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 of the life is communion with someone, right? Ultimately, God, but we see the, the natural fulfillment of that in, in Adam and Eve, okay? So therefore, we see this, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were naked but not ashamed because there's no fear at that time. You know, we live in a broken world, right, where we're trying to protect ourselves. But back then, they didn't worry about that, right, because no one had ever hurt anybody before, right? So they're innocent. There's not this sense of a need to protect myself, which doesn't last very long. And we'll get to that next week. But before we do, I want to give you one last image because, remember, we're reading everything canonically, right? So Adam, right, he falls asleep, and from his side comes his bride, right? Does that sound anything interesting that we've also heard before Jesus Christ right he falls asleep on the wood of the cross and then from his side come blood and water which is like birth right and who's born from his side the church his bride do you see how the bible begins with a marriage and then there's a marriage in the Gospels. And then in the book of Revelation, we see that the church, the new Jerusalem, is coming down out of heaven like a bride waiting for her husband. So really the whole Bible is about marriage. You see why the church cares about marriage so much? There's a real deep theology. It's really rich. We can't get into more of it tonight, but maybe you can talk about that a little bit in your groups. We're going to break up right now into our small groups, okay? So um, I'm going to give you a couple of questions just to talk about. You just raise your hand big if you want. Then what I want us to do is right where you are, okay, we're gonna, just going to break into small groups for just a little bit, okay, so I want you to pair up with just four to six people, all right, all right, and then I want you to talk about this first question, all right, what did you hear about the, the, what, what the scriptures, these first chapters taught us about God, 
and creation, okay? Or what was one new thing that you learned that you didn't know, okay? We're gonna do that for five minutes and we'll come back together, all right? And if there's weird things that come up, you're like, I didn't understand that at all, we can talk about that before everybody comes back in, all right? 